Welcome to the third in a series of videos on standard steel trusses. This is from chapter 7, section 3, and this is the third video in the sequence. The first video dealt with how standard steel trusses with double angle top and bottom cords are fabricated. The second video dealt with design resources that are available from the Steel Joist Institute that sets the standards for these uh, steel trusses. This particular video we're going to do an example of how those tables are used to do preliminary sizing and cost estimating. Um, we're going to focus on the roof. We're going to design joists uh, that are K-trusses. We'll also size the perimeter girder trusses and the interior girder trusses. In the next video, we'll focus on the floor where we will use uh, LH trusses for the joists. This 30 by 30 column grid is exactly the one that we used for our example of steel beam sizing. And when we are done, we will compare the weights of the open web joist or steel trusses to the weights that we got for the solid web wide flange beams. And we will discover which, uh, where one or the other of these seems to be preferred from a point of view of structural efficiency. So this is the, uh, co the uh, structural plan. Um, here we have columns spaced every 30 feet on center in two directions. Here we have a perimeter girder, an interior girder, and a series of joists. And these are going to be, for the roof, the K5 trusses, and this will be uh, a truss girder and a truss girder. Um, in this case, we have six of these spaces to fill out a bay, and a bay is 30 feet in dimension. So that means that the joist-to-joist -joist spacing is five feet, which is exactly what we used when we did steel beams, and we're sticking to that for comparison purposes. And that means each of these trusses is supporting a swash of roof um, that is five feet wide. So just to refresh your memory, this is what something like this would look like. Here we have the truss joists. In this case, they're shown with a solid round bar for the webs. This would be the girder, which has some elements that are uh, single angles with mashed ends to fit between the double angle bottom and top cords and some of the more highly loaded web members are double angles. We don't have to worry about any of the details of what those web members are like or how they're welded in because the industry is going to take care of that for us. And so what we want to do is focus on using their tables to make estimates of what the weights will be uh, for the various structural elements in this roof. As we mentioned before, two pieces of data are required to use the k truss tables. <coughs> One is the total factored line distributed load, little w, which is 1.2 times little w dead plus 1.6 times little w live. This is our factored gravity load that we start with. And by the way, we mentioned before that in the end we have to account for the self-weight of the joist itself also. So eventually we would want to include in this a 1.2 W self for the joist. However, we don't know what the size of the joist is at this point. So we're going to size it, then incorporate that weight, then check it again. The second thing we need is W live, which we always need as part of our check for is the structure stiff enough that it won't be bothersome. So all this can be handled in the following one page spreadsheet which I've put together and which will be provided to you. 
Um, and this looks awfully messy right now because it's hard to see at this screen resolution. Um, so what I could do is I can either do a zoom in to show the upper portion of this, and that's what that looks like. Uh, or at this point I can also go to the active spreadsheet, and I think I'll do that because in, in the end I would like to show you um, what the formulas are in the various cells and also show you how we can go about manipulating things. So here we are in Excel um, where we've labeled this uh, the design or should be sizing of roof truss joists and truss girders. Um, so we have the joist length in feet and the girder length in feet and in this case we've input 30 and 30 in each case because that's the uh, column grid that we're dealing with. On the other hand, if you take this spreadsheet, it's basically a template, so you can type any number in here that you would like. So, for example, you did a homework problem on beams where you did a 40 by 40 um, grid. Um, you could just substitute those numbers here. These numbers get used in subsequent calculations down this page, uh, but these are input variables. So I've labeled them with bold blue lettering as a reminder that those are inputs. So first of all, we're going to do look at K trusses. The joist spacing, which we mentioned, is 5 feet. We're going to use the same dead load that we used in the sizing of beams. And I'll refresh your memory that the weight of this structure on the roof is typically going to be 10 pounds or less because steel is an extremely efficient structure and even when we account for the joist, the girders, the steel decking, the rigid insulation, the recovery board, the membrane, and some HVAC ductwork hanging off of the system, it's still less than 10 pounds. But we've always in this class put 20 pounds per square foot to account for 10 pounds a square foot of unforeseen future load. It's really crazy to design a building where people can't add anything to it and it's, it's prudent to build in this extra capacity because people will tend to make changes in the building and they will assume that somehow there's enough capacity there without even checking it. In the state of North Carolina, as we've mentioned, for any North Carolina project, you're required to put in an extra 10 pounds a square foot of unforeseen uh, future load. So that's how we arrived at this 20 pounds a square foot of dead load. And one of the reasons we don't calculate it very uh, precisely, and we just kind of throw these numbers at it, is that these numbers are so small and the efficiency of the structure is so high that adding a little extra load capacity adds almost nothing to the cost of the building and it's a huge savings in the future if someone does need to add some additional load the fundamental structure of the building doesn't have to go back and be modified which is horrendously expensive after people have already occupied the building <coughs> again P live in this area is 20 pounds a square foot or actually in the state of North Carolina the live load on the roof is always 20 pounds a square foot uh, and in, the, in our location the snow load is actually less than that so we take the P live as the higher load and that's 20 pounds a square foot. So now we're going to use all those input numbers and we're going to do some calculations like we know we always need to know W dead along the joist so W dead along the joist this formula says B5, which is this number right here, which is 5 feet, times B6, which is P dead. So this is our classic P times the spacing is equal to W. Um, and we've done this calculation, by the way, when we did the steel beams. It comes out to 100 pounds per linear foot along the beam. Now here's where the format of the spreadsheet gets to be a little bit odd. And the reason is that you'll notice that uh, we jump 
two lines down and do W Live. So let's go ahead and do that and then we'll talk about why we did it. W Live is equal to B5, which is this five foot spacing, times B7, which is the area distributed live load P sub Live. So that comes out to 100 also because P dead and P live are the same. Uh, w dead and W live are the same in pounds per foot. Now W live, I put in bold and I put it in red. And the reason is that you're going to go into some tables and the corresponding number that you're looking for will be red. So in between here, and this is what's a little odd, I have the full factored load 1.2 W dead plus 1.6 W live. And that ends up being, we can look at that formula, it's 1.2 times B8, which is this. And then it's uh, 1.6 times B10, which is that. Now, normally, if you're thinking in sequential terms, you would calculate W live before this factored load, and you would put <coughs> in the sequence of your computations, you'd put W live before you put that. But I have reorganized these because you're going to go into some tables and you're going to be looking for um, two numbers that are presented in this fashion. The number above is the, uh, the safe overall full factored gr gravity load. And the one below that is the live load. This will be in black. That will be in red. And organizing this visually in this manner makes it much less confusing when you go into tables. And believe me, I tried it the other way, and the students tried it the other way, and it's always very confusing if you don't put this information in a visual format that makes scanning the tables easier. So that's the point of this little note here, is that these things were sequenced in this way to facilitate reading tables for K-trusses. And by the way, here are some formulas just um, to reinforce what's in this cell. It's B5 times B6, so it's that times that, which is uh, P dead times the joist spacing. This is W live equals P live times the joist spacing. And then the factored uh, total line distributed load is 1.2 times W dead plus 1.6 times W live. So, to make all this visually more accessible, um, I've written these in formula form. All right, so armed with this information, 280 over 100, we can go into the steel joist tables um, for K-trusses. So we're going to do that. We're going to go back to um, our tables here. And this is the first in the series for the K-trusses. You'll recall there's an 8-inch deep K-truss, a 10-inch, several 12-inch, some 14s, and a bunch of 16s. And it turns out when we look at a, uh, a, a span of 30 feet, uh, 14s don't work, but a 16 does. Now, if we look at this one, this one doesn't work because 240 is less than two, 241 is less than 280, and uh, 86 is less than 100. Likewise, 270 is less than 280, and 96 is less than 100. But this one works. <coughs> so we scan up here, and we see that's a 16K4, which is 16 inches deep, and it weighs 7 pounds per foot. Now, we need to make sure that that's the lightest one. We know that none of these work, but there might be a deeper one that works. So we're going to do 18 Ks, and we're going to come down to 30 feet. And we see this first one works because 304 is greater than 280, which is our target. And 123 is greater than 100. So we say an 18 K3 works. It's 18 inches deep and it weighs 6.6 .6 pounds per foot. So 
the the lightest 16 inch one that worked was seven pounds this one is 6.6 .6. so this one is uh, more appropriate given the way we typically play this game um, which is we take the lightest member and for certain reasons it's going to become clear why in this case it's sort of doubly logical to pick this 18 inch deep one now we're going to just jump up to the 20s to see if there's anything lighter there and we see the lightest one is 6.7 and the lightest 22 is 8 so this is the lightest truss that works it's an 18 k3 18 inches deep and 6.6 .6 pounds per foot so i'm going to go back and look at my spreadsheet and here you have an 18 k3 it weighs 18 it's 18 inches deep and it weighs 6.6 .6 pounds per foot and just for the fun of it or actually to sort of inform us relative to our sense of proportions i've taken the ratio of the length over the depth so the length is a3 the length of the joist is 30 feet then i've multiplied that times 12 to get it into inches and then i'm going to divide it by c16 which is the depth in inches so this is the length to depth ratio it's 20 which is comfortably within the range of of what we would uh, normally think of as trusses in fact l over d equal to 20 <coughs> is sort of the classic number that we pick um, in roofs we often end up with even shallower trusses uh, sometimes um, l over 24 uh, in this case it didn't work out quite that way but we can go down as far as l over 24 we never go below that for trusses though uh, here's the weight and to put all that information in a format that's consistent with the way we typically think about things like in buildings we almost always ask questions like how much does something weigh per square foot of building how much material per square foot of building how many how many dollars per square foot of building so i have taken the weight of this joist which is 6.6 .6 pounds per foot and i've asked when we distribute that over the floor area how much does that weigh so the formula i've used is e16 which is this weight divided by b5 which is the spacing between the joists times one um, now the reason i wrote the formula in that fashion is that every linear foot of this k truss has associated with it two things 6.6 .6 pounds of weight of the truss but also five square feet of floor area in other words it's the space it's the distance to the next truss times the one foot of floor that's associated with that one foot of joist so when i work it out that way we're basically dividing 6.6 .6 by five and we end up with a weight per square foot on the floor of 1.32 pounds so we're going to continue this process down we'll come back and revisit this number and make some observations all right so we now have to check the capacity when we account for the self weight also so you'll notice right here it says 1.2 self plus 1.2 dead plus 1.6 w live so <coughs> the original 280 becomes uh, 287.9 and this 7.9 is greater than 6.6 .6 because we've included uh, a uh, load factor on that also so in other words we've taken 1.2 times that weight and then we've added it to this weight so this is the factored load that we started with for dead imposed and w live and now we've added w self to that and we factored it also so we ended up with this number as the total number of 
uh, pounds per foot of total factored load, including the self-weight of the joist, and that's in pounds per foot. And then we go back to the value in the table, which we found, I think was 304, but just to check ourselves, we're gonna go do that again. And for the, actually, yes, for 30 feet, the 18K3 can safely support a total factored load, including a self-weight of 304. So when you come back, we've got 304 there, and 304 is greater than this, so we say that this truss is satisfactory. Now we're going to look at the total factored weight which would be this number multiplied by the length of the joist. So that's what this formula right here is. <clears throat> Big W total factored is little w total factored times the length of the joist. So this is in pounds per foot. We're going to multiply by 30 feet and we end up with 8,638 pounds as the total factored gravity load associated with this K truss joist. Now, the next step is we want to design the girders. And this number right here, by the way, was a crucial step in preparing ourselves to design the girders. Because as you recall, we said girders are specified in terms of the point forces on the joints of the girder. And because this is the total weight associated, factor load associated with the K truss, that will tell us how much force that K truss is exerting on the joist, on the girders, excuse me. So, um, for a perimeter girder, we're going to take half of this, but we want to express it in kips instead of pounds. So we're going to take half of that, and then we're going to divide by a thousand to get it into kips. And that's the load that one of these K trusses can exert as a factored load on the perimeter, on a vertex of the perimeter girder. We take this number as it stands and divide it by a thousand to convert it to kips, and that's the load or the force on a vertex of an interior girder. So that information is transferred directly down here. This number is put in this cell and this number is put in this cell. Now, the dilemma with the tables is that it gives discrete values. And I think I'm going to do this interior girder first just to demonstrate how the tables get used. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to scroll down <coughs> until I find the appropriate table here. And we'll blow this up. So you refer the, remember that the girders are given for a given length. Then we have a certain spacing of the forces on the girder. So the, the spacing of the forces on the girder is the same as the spacing of the joists because the joists are what are putting the forces on the girder. So we have a five foot spacing of the joist or six spaces each of five feet. And um, we have up above a series of forces that could be applied to the joints of the girder. So there's six kips, 7.5 kips. And we're not working with ASD here. We're working with the load and resistance factor design. But you'll notice this table allows you to work in either system seamlessly, but you need to make sure you remember which system you're in and always pick numbers that are consistent with that. So for example, if you have nine kips on a vertex and you have five feet per vertex, if you scan down here, this says your truss will weigh 24 pounds per foot if you pick a 24 inch deep truss. If you go to a deeper truss, you can reduce that weight somewhat to 20 pounds a linear foot and that's the amount of steel in the girder. And so um, 
you've saved some weight by making it deeper, which is consistent with our expectations. Um, there are a few anomalies in this table having to do with these really low uh, weight values, and I'm not quite sure why we jump up, except that I guess on these trusses, if we get deep enough, we're no longer saving enough material on the web on the cord members and we may be increasing the weight of web members in order to resist buckling but generally speaking the trends are that as you go from shallow to deeper girders the weight go of the girder goes down this is sort of a general rule we've understood for quite a while now normally i say always pick the lightest member. In our case, if we pick the lightest member here, we'd be picking something 36 inches deep, which is, when you think about the fact that that's three feet, we're spanning 30 feet, that's um, L over D is equal to 10, which is generally outside the guidelines of what we're looking for. Now, there's no rule here. As I mentioned before, Many times you want these deeper trusses, in a, especially in a really tall space, then they don't look as ridiculous. So you may choose to go with a three foot deep or you may choose to go with a 24 inch deep. In, in my case, right at the moment, I'm gonna just pick the shallowest depth because it's still a pretty efficient truss and I'm trying to keep the overall height of the structure lower. Um, in general, though, if I ever gave you a problem like this and I expected you to do something other than the lightest member, I would have to specify that for you or accept whatever answer you chose to uh, select. In other words, it would be your option to pick which of these depths you would choose. All right, so that's how the table works. If we had something like eight kips that we were designing to, we'd have to interpolate between the numbers for 7.5 kips and 9 kips. In other words, we'd have to interpolate between that number and that one. And so that's what we're actually getting ready to do. I want you to notice for 9 kips, it weighs 24 pounds per foot. For 7.5 kips, it weighs 19. So we're going to go back to our spreadsheet. And you'll notice I wrote 19 here. 24 there. This is the lower force on a vertex. That's the higher of the two forces in the table. This is the lower force in the table. That's the higher. And this is the force in between that we're trying to interpolate to. So we have a formula here. And I'll click on this cell so that you can see. This is one of the more complicated kind of formulas that we use. This is what it looks like written out mathematically. And we'll say the interpolated self weight of the truss, which is this number right here, um, is equal to the lower self weight, which is that one, plus, and then in parentheses, we have the upper one minus the lower one. So this parentheses here would be the five pounds per foot of differential between that and that. So we're starting at the lower value and then we're adding something and we're going to take a certain proportion of this five pounds, which will be this number minus the lower divided by that number minus the lower. So this ratio tells us what fraction of the way we are going up between this number and that number. And, uh, so this is the design force right here. This is the lower force. This is the upper force. That's the lower force. So that's what this formula is doing. And you can sort of intuitively see that 8.64 is a lot closer to 9 than it is to 7.5. And 22.8 is a lot closer to 24 than it is to 19. So intuitively, we look at that and we sense that it's working right. But if we had any doubts, we can check it at the extremes. 
we could come along and we could say instead of B26, we could put a 9 in there. And I'll just do that. And we get 24. Or if I put a 7.5, we get 19. So I'm going to undo both those, but we see that at the limits, our formula makes sense. So this is our estimated self-weight. Now, I did the interior girder first because the perimeter girder, we're looking at an extremely lightweight load situation, which actually um, isn't included in the tables. And it's not that the steel industry can't make you that girder. They can. Um, but to save paper, uh, and a lot of people still use their manual and paper form, uh, they don't do calculations for trusses that are outside the range of what they typically deal with. So um, I'm sure you can call up the uh, truss girder people and ask them to give you an accurate estimate. But here's our challenge. Here we came up with this number right there, which is the factored force on a vertex for the perimeter girder, and it came out to be that. Now, uh, if we go look in the tables, there's a, a six kip, which is the lowest force that they give in the table, and it corresponds to, uh, for a 24 inch deep girder, 17 pounds per linear foot. Unfortunately, there's no number lower than that, so we don't have a number down here to bracket that, and therefore we can't interpolate. Um, it's very suspect to be extrapolating beyond the tables because the weight of the truss is not a linear function, especially at low loads. It's not a linear function of the amount of load on it. So we can't really interpolate, extrapolate rather. But I did just for the fun of it, I put a zero there and said, well, if we were at the lower force on a vertex of zero, that would suggest that our truss needs to have roughly zero weight, which is not quite accurate because just to hold itself up, the truss needs some kind of weight. But I put a zero in both of those and let the interpolation run its course, and we get 12.2 pounds. Now, if, if we were actually ordering off-the-shelf items, we would have to pick the girder that corresponds to this lower load, and it would be 17 pounds per foot. Um, this table says, well, probably we can get more down around 13 or at least as low as 14, but we'd have to get the steel uh, truss people to check it. For the moment, though, if we just take this number, we can continue on with our calculations and see where it leads. So what I've done is I've taken the 12.2 and I put it right there and the 22.8, and I put it right there. And so this is a summary of dimensions and materials uh, that are consumed, and I guess I don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> so, key information. The two girders we chose were 24 inches deep. We could have gone all the way up to 36 inches, but we went with the 24 just to keep the height of the building from being too high. Uh, I took the proportions of 30 feet for the length of the girder. So this is the formula. It's um, B3 is the length of the girder. I multiplied by 12 and then divided by C51, which is that. And then here it's uh, the same thing divided by C52. So both of those are the same depth. They have the same proportions, which is length over D is equal to 15. That's a very efficient truss. So I don't, I'm not bothered that I picked <clears throat> a 24 inch deep truss. Um, I would only go deeper than that if I felt I had an architectural situation where there was essentially no other penalty for choosing um, a very deep proportion to the truss. So those are proportions. <clears throat> And I show them, <clears throat> I keep showing proportions because when we go through these detailed sizing operations, I want you to 
see what numbers we're coming up with so you'll understand the rationale in chapter one for the various spans and proportions that we chose. <clears throat> Again, here we have the weights, 12.2 um, <clears throat> pounds per foot from right here for the perimeter girder. And by the way, that perimeter girder uh, supports a 15 foot wide swash of floor. So that perimeter, the weight of the perimeter girder, which is um, this E51 divided by A3 over two. So A3 was the length of the joist. We divide that by two, we get 15. And I could have uh, shown that as 15 times one as an area, which would have been the more appropriate way. Wouldn't have changed the arithmetic or the, the final number, but would make uh, this formula seem more logical. So in fact, I think I'll do that just for um, <clears throat> clarity. Uh, I'm going to put a one right there. Absolutely changes nothing, but that one is making it clear that we're talking about an area and it's 15 feet times one foot is the total area. And of course, if I was going to do that there, um, I should do it down here also. So I'll put A3, which is the length of a joist, which is the width of floor that this interior girder is supporting. Uh, and then per foot of girder, yeah, I have to include an area of 30 feet times one foot or 30 square feet. So that gives me the weight per square foot of the perimeter girder, uh, taking the total weight of perimeter girders and dividing by the floor, floor area. And this is the weight per square foot of floor of the interior girder, and that's the average. But when I add this number and that number to the same number for the joist, which was up here, I add all those together and I get 2.11 pounds per square foot. Now, this kind of steel construction, the cost, of course, varies depending upon world markets and the demand. Um, for about 30 years, the, the dollar cost of a pound of steel was about 0.25, and that was very steady. And then the installed cost was about 0.25, those costs have doubled or more, but this is roughly in the neighborhood of $2 a square foot of construction cost. But we're not going to spend much time talking about that because as I say, cost varies over time. But the key thing is you're expending a little over two pounds of steel per square foot to support this roof. <clears throat> One other comment I want to make is that these girders, um, are more efficient in that they, we require fewer pounds per square foot of girder to support the floor than we do of joists. And the reason is that girders are more heavily loaded. They have, therefore, are less vulnerable to buckling because the members are inherently fatter because of the higher loads. So that once we get them at, away from the buckling regime, and more towards fat proportions, we're able to load them to a higher stress level. Second of all, these girders have deeper proportions. So we've got L over D equals 15, whereas for the joist up here, we had L over D is 20. So um, the girders in general are acting in a more efficient way and they're adding less to the cost of the uh, structural system than are the joist. So <clears throat> that ends our lecture on sizing roof trusses using standard steel trusses for the 30 by 30 column grid. We've gone through the sizing of the K trusses, the sizing of the perimeter girder trusses, the sizing of the interior girder trusses, We've calculated the total weight of steel that's required to support these things and discovered it's a very low number. Um, 
two pounds a square foot, and then when you add rigid insulation and recovery board and say two pounds of roof decking, the total weight of this roof structure is uh, only around six pounds. And then we might add some duct work that would run it up to eight pounds. So that helps you understand when I say the weight of this roof is 10 pounds a square foot or less, uh, these numbers help you understand where that comes from. Okay, so we've sized the roof. Our next video will be to go through the same kind of sizing procedures for the floor.